good box wearables, as you may have noticed. Um, hopefully, you're in the right room. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am an engineering evangelist. If you tell me not, feel free to ask me what that means um, at the party. I am a JavaScript and Node addict. Um, I'm a hardware enthusiast, and I'm a GIF connoisseur. But actually, this is the only GIF in this presentation. So enjoy it, because usually they're littered. But like today, I just kind of wasn't feeling like that panda. Um, and that panda is how I feel most days working on hardware. Um, <laughs> like just wanting to. Um, I'm covered in node bots, so uh, yeah, as you again may have noticed, mostly it's my uh, skirt and my shoes today. My name tag's not quite cooperating, but we'll still go over that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to not go through my slides too quickly. So I'm going to go over three main points today in this talk. One of them is the wearable JS platforms that I use and uh, the pros and cons of each. The wearable specific skills and problems that come up when I am making something that I intend to wear. And how you can get involved, because I, I can assume if you're sitting in one of these chairs that you're at least somewhat interested in building wearable technology with JavaScript. And so, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit about how you can get involved. Um, first, I'm going to mention um, if you're thinking of NodeBots as just Johnny Five, go ahead and toss that idea out the window. Um, I actually do not use. I love Johnny Five. Preface that. Um, I do not use Johnny Five in any of my demos because it just doesn't fit my needs. But Johnny Five is still an awesome library. But um, I'm trying to help redefine NodeBots as more than just Johnny Five. Basically, any interfacing with a robot or any programming for a robot in JavaScript should constitute as a NodeBot. And um, you'll see a few of these platforms today. So I'm going to cover four platforms. The first is the Esperino. Um, this chart is kind of the things I look at when I'm looking for a platform for a project. Whether it has Wi-Fi, what the price is, whether it runs native JS, the docs and support, and whether it has its own cloud API is kind of like a minor thing, but it's becoming more important. Um, the Esperino does not have Wi-Fi built in. You can get a CC3000 chip and surface solder it, which if you've never surface soldered before, it's kind of terrifying, <laughs> but you can do it. Uh, and there's libraries for it. And the price is $40 for one of the boards, which is relatively cheap if you're not considering Arduino. Uh, for JavaScript platforms, that is relatively cheap. Native.js, yes, it runs its, its modified version of V8 that um, I'll show you some of the code for. The docs and support are kind of, they're there, but they're really hard to find sometimes. And debugging this platform can be a giant pain. And there is no cloud API. What's great about Esperino is it's tiny. I um, actually have my, it's like two inches long by about an inch and a half wide. Like not very, not very long, big at all. It's got a built-in battery connector for lithium polymer batteries, which is pretty awesome. Or if you want to do coin cells or basically anything with a standard battery connector, really nice that it's already on there for you. Uh, there are tons of GPIO on this board. Like it is just covered in GPIO. Lots of PWM pins, lots of analog pins. It's great. If you want to do something with tons of sensors or tons of lights. And like I said, it's pretty cheap, but not compared to Arduino. What's not so great is you just get the board with no headers already attached. So if you're prototyping, you're going you to want to solder your, I have two Esperinos. One is in this project. The other one has um, headers soldered to it. So I can basically put prototyping wire in there and actually build something. Like I said, no Wi-Fi built in. And the firmware can be a little shaky. I usually wait when they announce an update for about a week. And then they'll announce another update. And I'll install that one. Um, the firmware can be kind of shaky on it. But it's really easy to it, so I really haven't had any huge problems running code on the Esperino. So the demo I have for this is actually the skirt I'm wearing. So you can kind of see it's covered in 42 NeoPixels. It's got an algorithm right now based on a hue saturation value algorithm. So basically, it's just cycling through all the hues at a full saturation and value, so you get a rainbow. I've also got it to where I can do a couple different patterns. So if I hit the button. This is randomly setting a value to blue uh, for each pixel. And then the last one runs around the skirt and back. And that's by basically telling it, like, set an index, go to this pixel, go to the next one. So I will show you guys the code for this. All right. So this is the Esperino IDE. IDE. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with this IDE. Um, it crashes. Uh, kind of regularly. Uh, it's a Chrome app. I mean, it's, it's really nice in the sense that, you know, they, they put some design to it and it does syntax highlighting and that's really nice. Um, 
One really annoying thing for presentations is I cannot make this any bigger. So I'm going to kind of go over it. Uh, actually, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to do this. Plain text. All right. So basically, um, I'm telling it I want to set up an SPI clock. And that's to tell the NeoPixel how it communicates with the NeoPixels. Um, consider each NeoPixel three shift registers because it takes three bytes. One byte for red, one byte for green, one byte for blue. And then it passes the data on to the next pixel. So this tells it how fast I need it to communicate and what pin uh, I'm communicating on, which is B15. There are A through C, and I think they all have 15 pins. So like I said, tons of GPIO on the s uh, I'm then creating a typed array of, of integers. And 42 times 3, the number of lights times 3, because I need 3 bytes per light. Um, these are variables used in the algorithm that runs the light around the skirt. And then patterns is an array, and when I push the button, it cycles to the next pattern, which is why I went from rainbow to flashing blue to chasing blue. Um, this first pattern is the rainbow. So the color is determined by an HSV to RGB algorithm of I. So like I said, I'm cycling through each hue. And um, yeah, I'm using this, which I got off Stack Overflow, honestly. Um, HSV to RGB is a interesting conversion. The second pattern, like I said, it's just assigning a random value to blue for each pixel. And that's why it kind of looks like it's flickering. And then this last one, I am, um, actually, that should just not be there. Um, so, basically I'm saying if the index that I'm at is the position that I need to be at, like the, the pixel that I'm trying to light up, light it up uh, to 255, otherwise set it to zero. That way it makes all the lights turn off except the one that I'm trying to address. As you can see, this is all very typical JavaScript. This is, I mean, the most, the most advanced part of this is dealing with a typed array. Um, so this is, this is JavaScript that basically just about everybody can write um, very easily. And that's one of the reasons I like the Esperino is it's very, it's not very modified JavaScript and it's not even Node. You don't even need to know how Node works to use an Esperino. If you know client side JavaScript, you can use this microcontroller. So now we're going to go to back to the slides. So the next platform I'm going to talk about is the Pinocchio. So the Pinocchio is the most advanced platform in some ways that I'm going to talk about, and it's also the most expensive. Um, so Pinocchio is meant to build troops. It is a mesh networking robot. So when you build, when you buy a starter kit, you get a lead scout and a scout. What makes a lead scout is it's just a regular scout with a Wi-Fi backpack. So your troop communicates via the lead scout, to, like via Wi-Fi, and then the lead scout communicates to the rest via a low power radio signal. So um, yeah, you can build distributed systems pretty well with Pinocchio. The starter kit is $200. And again, that gives you a lead scout and a scout, and that is really pricey. Um, it does not run Native.js without Johnny5. There is a Johnny5 wrapper. Um, again, with Johnny5, I need to remain tethered to a computer, so I didn't do that. I used JavaScript in terms of working with their cloud API and working with custom written functions that I'll show you in a minute. <coughs> and the docs and support are pretty good. Uh, Ryan Day on Twitter is like super responsive anytime you might have a problem, or they're really responsive on their GitHub as well. So uh, definitely a good crew there. And uh, yeah, they do have a cloud API. So like, like I said, mesh robots, that's kind of what's great about Pinocchio. They are the, the only platform I know of that's even remotely close to working with JavaScript that has mesh networking built in. You don't have to worry about it. It's super simple to communicate with your troop. Uh, the cloud API allows custom functions. So I can use a JavaScript API to run an Arduino function on my Pinocchio. Um, they're tiny, I'll show you in just a minute, with a built-in battery, so you don't have to worry about providing your own power source, and they charge via USB. Super handy. And their HQ is pretty neat, and um, you'll see that in the demo. What's not so great is very, very expensive. Um, a, a, an extra scout is $35, so you're looking at, for like a troop of five, you're looking at $300. So it's not, it, it's a little primarily expensive. Um, without some Johnny Five, you will want some Arduino knowledge in order to basically get the, be able to access the functions you want via the API. You'll need to put them in via Arduino, but it's not terribly hard. So the demo I have for these is my shoes, and I have some specialized equipment to help me show these off. So, all oh right, gotta exit the slides. So. 
this lovely, y'all see that? Yeah, y'all can see that, awesome. I just realized, how am I gonna favorite something? Okay, I'll grab my phone, I'm gonna go to Twitter. Actually, Chris is gonna favor one of my tweets and for some reason my shoes aren't gonna kick in. Oh, come on. Why isn't that working? I know, I know, I know. Um, here, so I'm gonna show you all the HQ in order to um, kind of debug this and figure out why they're not working. Oh, wait, wait, oh, dang it. Okay, so they're, they're yellow. Um, I guess there's just lag. Oh yeah, I have a terrible cell signal, that's why. Um, these are connected to my cell phone. So as you can see, it's flashing yellow. Basically, my shoes are listening to a user stream attached to my Twitter account via an external server. And that external server says, okay, every time there's a favorite, go tell the Pinocchio to flash gold. And um, so they flash white, they pulse white mostly to assure me that my shoes still work. Um, plus it kind of looks cool when you're walking down the street and all of a sudden your shoes are like, bam. Like, I went into a party in downtown Austin and um, some ravers walked by me and immediately saw my shoes and were like, how? Where? <laughs> Credit card. Take my money. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I guided them to some resources. But yeah, um, the other shoe also lights up. And you can see on the back, oh, they're still closed. Hold on one second. I'm going to talk while I'm, I'm fixing my shoe. So I'm going to show you all the lead scout. The reason that they're in these lovely boxes is because waterproofing is important. Because, you know, when you spend a lot of money on a robot platform, you don't want a random puddle to uh, destroy your shoes. I mean, I don't think you ever want a random puddle to destroy your shoes, but that's not the point. Uh, Sorry about the delay. Um, but yeah, uh, so the, the, like I said, the left shoe is the only one connected to the internet. The left shoe is communicating with the right shoe via a low power radio. And that's why both shoes light up when I tell them to. So, cool. So that right there, on the, that, white, uh, that, that white and green, that is the Wi-Fi shield on top of my lead scout. I'm gonna see if I can gracefully Pull this out a little more. Okay. Perfect. So you can see the battery dangling down there at the bottom. The top thing is the Wi-Fi. The bottom part down here, the little shorter part, is the Scout. You all can kind of, there you go, you can see that. And so, yeah, that's, that's my left shoe. And uh, yeah, so that's the shoes. I'm gonna show you the code. All right, so first, actually I'm gonna show you the HQ because um, you can do some really nifty stuff with HQ, and actually that reminds me. Just put that back down. <laughs> so, when I said you can create custom, they're called scout script functions. Um, I created one to change the pulse color of the shoe when it's not showing a favorite. And I call it pixels.change. So I'm going to tell lefty, pixels.change, 255.0.0. So this should be red. Yeah, no, Lefty did not check in two minutes ago. Lefty checked in like 30 seconds ago now. Anyway. <laughs> It'll get a response. Oh, there it goes. It's, is it red yet? No, it's still white. I'm gonna run that again. Oh, it's red? Awesome. Sweet. Okay, so then I'm gonna tell Brady, pixels.change. Would help if I could spell, yep. I'm gonna change it to purple. So 50, zero, 150. And I'm gonna change my uh, camera over. So while we're waiting for lefty to change, I've updated the colors. Come on, be purple. Yes! <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've updated the colors via the Wi-Fi. Woo! And it's still, if you favorite stuff, it will still turn gold. Um, but yeah, um, so that's Pinocchio HQ. Um, you can add troops via, it's, it's, it's on their website. It's really nifty. I really have enjoyed it. It also shows the battery state of the shoe. So that green box in the upper right corner shows that uh, righty is at 43% and lefty is at 49%. So I will need to charge my shoes before the party. There's also a built-in temperature sensor. 
Uh, 90 degrees, basically uh, it's a little bit because electronics cause heat and they allow a little bit of heat. So that temperature sensor, especially on the lead scout, is underneath the Wi-Fi shield. So it can get it can get a little warm in there. And so it'll read a little uh, hotter than the actual room temperature. Right, you would probably be a little more accurate, closer, closer to accurate. Um, it's funny, people are favoriting stuff from <laughs> showing up. Um, so, uh, I'm like, I need to turn my watch off so I can stop staring at that. Anyway, uh, like I said, you can run fu functions from here. You can also control the pins, which I really like. That I don't have to write code to figure out what's going to happen when I turn this pin on. I can just say, uh, I want D2 to be an input, and I, or, and I want it to be analog or digital, or I want it to be an output, and I want to set it to this. It gives you some really great hardware debugging tools in the HQ to work with. So it's a very polished, very well put together platform. The only problem I've had with it so far is HQ does not really work correctly for me unless I'm in Chrome Canary. Uh, when I'm in regular Chrome, and they're working through that right now, but when I'm in Chrome Canary, it works fine. So I'm going to show you uh, the server code first. And uh, I did hide my Twitter keys, so don't even try it. Um, <laughs> so what I've got is I need, a, I need a troop ID, I need the scout ID for my left shoe, and I, hmm? Shift Apple plus plus. Oh no, that, wait, oh, I can do this. Ha, ha. <laughs> All right, so uh, troop ID, lefty ID, righty ID. Uh, I'm telling the Nokia API I want, all, I want my troops, and if there's an error, let me know. Otherwise, I want the shoes to be my first troop. I only have one, so I can kind of assume that the first troop is my shoes, but you know, you might write it differently if you have multiple troops. Um, I then say I want the, the scouts from that troop. Oh, we're doing good on time. Um, lefty and righty are then zero and one, mostly because I know lefty is lead scout, so it will always be the first scout reported, and there's only two scouts in the troop. I then tell Twitter I want my user stream, pardon me, and that I want um, on favorite, I want a console.log because I forgot to delete my debugging statements, mm -hmm. uh, and I want the Pinocchio API to run the scout command pixels.flash 255.255.0, which gives it a, a goldenrod yellow. And, um, I tell both shoes to do this. So sometimes there's a little bit of lag and one shoe goes off before the other. I'm working on making this, this the uh, scout script fire both shoes at the same time in the Arduino. Um, I'm gonna show you the Arduino code as well. I thought. No, I am, yeah, there it is. I know where it is, all right, cool. There's that. So this will not have syntax highlighting, but it will still be available. So this is Arduino C. I'm including um, the Adafruit NeoPixel library and the NeoPixel strip animator, which was written by another Pinocchio contributor who made a tie that um, reacted to music. It was really cool. Um, so the, the interesting thing I want to show you if, you, if you've known our Arduino code, the only real thing that's going to look a little weird is in the setup function, I'm doing this thing called add bit latch functions. And that's how I'm able to access Arduino code with JavaScript, as I'm saying, I want these Arduino functions to map to a Scout script command that when I call the API on that command, I want that Arduino function to run. So um, change color is how I changed it to red and purple. Uh, Pixels.clear clears out all the pixels just in case I need that. And pixels.flash is what causes the golden rod to kind of cycle around and, and show up. Um, yeah. Other than that, it's very typical uh, Arduino code. I actually borrowed a lot of it. I don't, I am relatively new to C in Arduino, only a couple months, so this is not very hard. Um, if you're worried about like trying to figure out Arduino, it's not that hard. Um, but yeah, that's the Pinocchio and the demo. So we're gonna go into the next platform, which is the Spark Core. So um, SparkCore's been doing a lot of marketing lately, so you've probably heard of this one if you've, you've done any hardware. Um, they're they're a, re a relatively new startup. Uh, they do have Wi-Fi built in. They use the CC3000 chip, but they are changing chips. They are going to do a hardware refresh sometime this calendar year, and they are changing Wi-Fi chips, which is actually fixes one of the major complaints I have about this platform. Um, it does not support native JS without Johnny 5. It is a remarkably like Pinocchio in that you write Arduino code, you say, I want these functions to be explicitly available via the JavaScript API, and then you run them with JavaScript. Um, the docs and support are pretty good. They're getting better each day, and they do have their own cloud API. 
So what's great about SparkCore, um, $40 for um, like this tiny little platform, I'll show it to you in a second when I show you the name tag, um, and they said their new hardware revision is going to be cheaper, which I will believe when I see it, but I'm totally rooting for them, because if they can be cheaper than $40, yeah. Um, Cloud API with custom mes methods, much like Pinocchio, and they have shields available, including one that I find really cool. It's a shield where you put it on there and it reconfigures the pins to be like an Arduino Uno. And so if you want to use an Arduino Uno shield with the Spark Core, you put your Spark Core on the shield and then you put your shield on that. So that's kind of cool because there are a lot of, of Arduino shields available already that people might want to use with this new technology. So um, I definitely find their, their shields are pretty interesting. They also have a battery shield that allows you to plug in a battery and also charge lithium polymer batteries, which is awesome because lithium polymer batteries are, are um, interesting to find chargers for. What's not so great? Uh, right now, with the CC3000 chip, putting multiple Spark cores on one network is remarkably wonky. Um, I've run two hackathons with Spark cores. Both of them were pretty shaky. Um, we had trouble with a lot of people signing on at the same time. Uh, I think the magic number is somewhere around 18 to 20 is where it starts to go wrong. Um, I've had five people and it was fine. 10 people was fine. 20 is when it went a little bit um, haywire. Without J5, J5, you will need Arduino knowledge, and it requires a Wi-Fi connection to run code. You can't run it offline right now. Uh, for now, they are fixing that with the new release, so hopefully that will no longer be the issue. Um, so, the demo is a name tag. A name tag is in quotes because my LCD is no longer displaying text correctly, but it still does what I kind of wanted it to do. And I'll show you what that is. So um, I'm going to pull the camera over here. I'm going to exit my slides, not trip on whatever this is. And camera. Oh, right. I left it on the floor. So first, I'm going to show you the back. Uh, I'm actually going to put up photo booth. So this is the back of uh, my name tag. So, oh, oh. That's kind of trippy. Let me see if I can like hold it a little differently to. Okay, so you can kind of see the spark core. That thing that looks like a mustache is the battery shield. Um, I don't like the mustache. Those things are sharp, and I've actually cut my finger on that. Um, I'm gonna complain to them. Um, so that CN light means that it is connected to the internet. On the front, it's just a RGB backlit um, LCD, and I'll show you what I mean by it's a little bit wonky. So that's what I got when I got out of the airport today, or yesterday, which was so awesome. So I'm just going to turn that down. So it's setting it blue right now. Now, what I'm going to do is I have a node server running. And that node server connects to the Spark Core API. So actually, I don't even need to go there. Um, I'm going to go to here. Okay. So I've got this little website and hopefully, oh wait, does the website still not work? No, I did not fix that. So I'm going to curl it instead because I have a backup plan. <laughs> so, so I'm going to curl my local host and I'm going to make that a lot bigger first. So I'm going to curl my local host, and I'm going to say uh, I want the, the, the page set color, and I want red to be 255, and green to be 255, and B to be 0. Right. Awesome. Oh, node index. What up with my server was? No, it was running, wasn't it? No, I guess it wasn't. Yeah. That would be why. Ah, I see where I'm at now. All right. Got my tabs mixed up. So that's where I'm supposed to be running my server. This is where it's supposed to be curling. So it has changed color, um, which I will show with the photo booth. So you'll notice it's changed color. Um, Again, this is through a custom function, much like the Scout script functions on my shoes. I basically said, okay, I want this Arduino code to run when I send this signal. And uh, yeah, it's basically, you can go to, um, I'm working on an actual like front end web page where you can go to it and change it uh, while I'm talking or whatever. And I need to get into an LCD so I can fix the text problem. But um, it does show the ability of the Spark port at least still. So that's kind of handy. Oh, code, right. 
besides the server, you'd probably like to see some code. Um, that's from the skirt, so it's gonna go away. Nope. All right, so I'm gonna go into my server. So, I just used Restify because I'm lazy, and um, request, and, and so basically I um, set a route for set color to send color. I also used a static server on port 1337, so that's how it loads the front end. But when you ping uh, port 8080 at set color, it calls a post to the Spark cloud, which says, I want this core to change to this color. And I do have to authenticate um, with the cert, with with Spark Core in order to do that. So uh, right here is where I do that. So you get your access token when you log on and um, get your key. So um, I can show you the actual robot code in their browser um, IED, which is also pretty nice. So this is that. So this is spark.io slash build, and this is the IDE that you can use to program Sparks. What I find really cool that I haven't been able to replicate with Pinocchio is if I hit that lightning bolt, it will flash the firmware onto the Spark core via Wi-Fi. And you can do that from an API as well. And you can say, I want you to take this binary, and I want you to flash all of these Spark cores with it online. So you don't need to physically be with the Spark core in order to change its firmware, which I find pretty freaking cool. Um, so I'm telling you to set up the LCD here, which is um, another library. Um, if you're uncomfortable using Arduino with a lot of uh, sensors or backpacks or things like the LCD, Adafruit is your best friend. They've written libraries for nearly everything on the planet that are Arduino compatible, and it takes only a little bit of modification to change them to have custom Scout script or Spark script functions. So again, if you're worried about using any Arduino, um, it's much easier than it looks because I can do it. Um, so again, this is the, the function that I've got that I'm exposing to allow it to change color. It just says take in red, green, blue. Um, uh, yeah, um, funny story. It, it sends all of the arguments that you send a Spark function as one string. So I had to tell it, okay, find the commas and split them out. So that was fun uh, in C. <laughs> reminded me why I really love higher level languages. And um, so sets the color. Um, the rest does the actual text moving. So I, I used to have my name, title, where I worked, uh, my Twitter handle, and the color it was currently lit up as. So it would cycle through those five lines, and it's a four line LCD. So uh, that's the rest of that code. And then as for my little, oh yeah, it shows you my server. So yeah, that's the code for the Spark Core. Again, mostly JavaScript with a little bit of C that I actually borrowed and cobbled together from a bunch of libraries that were already written. So, The last platform I'm going to go into is the Tessel. This is the other native JavaScript platform that I, I have today. Um, it does have Wi-Fi. The price is $100. I put an asterisk there because it, it's, it, they use their own modules. And those modules are more expensive than the modules you would pre you would buy for like an Arduino, but there's a reason um, that I use this platform, and I'll go into it in a little bit. Um, it does use native JS. It actually uses Node, so you write typical Node programs in order to control a Tessel, which a lot of people are very comfortable with, which is nice. Uh, the docs and support are also pretty good. Technical Machine is pretty good about responding to things quickly. Uh, they do not have a Cloud API yet. They have a GitHub repo called Cloud API, so I get the feeling. <laughs> They might have a cloud API in the future, it's just not there yet. <laughs> uh, what I like about Tessel is there is a lot of functionality available in the Tessel that is not ready yet on other JavaScript platforms, things like the camera, things like um, the GPS, things like the, three, the 2G, 3G, um, you can insert a SIM and use the card with it. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of functionality that we do not currently have with Johnny5 or with other platforms. It's well built and it's fairly easy to set up. Um, I've noticed even adding a battery to it with soldering two headers. Um, so yeah. What's not so great is, again, it is very, it, it's not as expensive as Pinocchio, but it is pretty expensive at $100 for the board and one module. And that asterisk is, again, if you want to purchase more modules, they're $25 to $35 a piece. So that can add up really quickly. Um, you cannot use their modules on other platforms yet. No one's figured out how. Um, they're supposedly open source, so I, I guess someone could figure it out, but um, not going to be me. 
and uh, debugging the tassel is a pain because often the errors stacks are, it uses a Lua based interpreter. And so I often find um, error stacks with a bunch of Lua.js and like Lua interpreter things and it's really hard to debug that code sometimes. Um, so the demo I have, I swear this has been the most finicky demo all day, so hopefully this will work, is I'm gonna take my tassel and I'm gonna plug in the battery and it's got a climate module on it. All right. So it's trying to connect to the internet. I should probably like put this on the camera, shouldn't I? My shoe is. Of course it didn't connect to the internet because, you know, that would be help helpful. So as you can see, um, it's trying. It's thinking about it. I have a crazy, oh, hey, what? it worked. OK, <laughs> so that yellow light means that it's connected. So now it's booting up the climate module. And hopefully, when I hit this button, it is going to read the climate, the temperature and the humidity off this module. And it's going to tweet it to my account. Uh, some of you, may, if you follow me on Twitter, may have seen live from the speaker room at Thunder Plains. That was from this. I was testing it. Um, so I'm going to do is I'm going to very carefully walk over here and go to my Twitter page. The, the battery connectors on this thing, I didn't solder them correctly. So if I move it too much, it'll like reset. So that's why I'm being all careful. And I'm going to go to my Twitter account. Wow, 32 notifications, guys. Wow. Um, OK, that's the most I've ever seen in one sitting. Um, hey, no, I haven't tweeted yet. I'm going to try hitting the button again. And give it a couple seconds. It tends to take a little bit to actually read the climate and um, tweet. So I'm going to give it some time. But it is connected to the internet. So uh, I'm going to let that run and hold it very steadily while I go over my next couple slides and then we'll see if it tweeted later in the presentation. Can I get a helper? I need two hands. So I'm going to just hold this. You can sit down in your seat, but just like hold that so the battery's just like hanging. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So what's in a wearables toolkit? Um, I, I think I have, what did I do? There we go. Uh, so this is the toolkit I carry around when I'm wearing the skirt to a conference or to work or whatever. Um, of course. Really? Come on, skirt. Work. Oh, I don't know what it is. I'm sitting on the reset button again. There we go. Anyway, if you hold the reset button for too long, the expert was like, I, I don't know what to do, I'm just going to bail. And so, <laughs> so that's what it did. Um, so, camera. I'm going to go over what I carry with me that's specific to wearables. Um, so, as for skills, soldering is important. Uh, I hate it, but it's important. Um, and basically being able to read it, either a fritzing graph or slowly learning how to read like the archaic you know, line drawings that engineers come up with. Like, man, those are weird. But uh, fritzing diagrams are awesome, and they're far more like widely available. But uh, so this is my kit, which trying to navigate a camera is like really um, trippy. So I'm going to set this down and just like show everything. So wire strippers, because there's wire. Um, all through here, all through there, all through everything. Uh, pliers and wire cutters for the same reason. I usually carry spare lithium polymer batteries. This is a small one, but um, I usually carry a few. Foam tape. Um, I, I actually probably gonna get rid of the foam tape because it tends to like really, really stick. And granted, that's something I kind of want sometimes, but like I don't want it permanent. Um, floral tape is something Chris Williams suggested that's probably a good idea for like temporarily binding something to another thing, and then it comes off clean, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I carry Johnny Five stickers everywhere because they're awesome. Um, so this, in particular is one of the best things to be invented ever, ever, ever when dealing with conductive thread or wire that is not solid core. And this is wire glue. It's conductive glue. It's kind of watery, so I use a, a paintbrush and I just like take a dollop. And there is like every connection between wire and conductive thread in my skirt has a dollop of wire glue on it best thing ever. And it's like three bucks at Radio Shot. Are you kidding? I bought out their entire inventory when I discovered what it was. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> I was like, how many bottles do you have of this? Um, conductive thread, 
kind of a pain and kind of high resistance. So if you're doing anything like this skirt where you're gonna be running between more than five or six LEDs, you're gonna to wanna to just like sew it to the piece of cloth with the conductive thread and then connect it to a wire that is not as high resistant. Um, two ply I find is a lot less of a pain to thread and to sew with than three ply. And if you get stuff that looks like thin yarn, that is not meant for sewing electronics together. That's meant for making conductive gloves like when you don't want to take your gloves off but you want to use your phone. That's what that's for. Two ply or three ply is all you need for sewing electronics together. Um, this is silicone coated 30 gauge wire. Um, it's very flexible. Solid core wire like this. It, it bends and it sticks. With the uh, silicone coated wire it's much more like string. Doesn't Band, great for wearables, because when you're moving or whatever, or you don't want your skirt to stick out at weird angles. Uh, those who saw me at my dress and JS comp, I was like constantly pushing down like random joints that were sticking out of the skirt, because <laughs> the wire was like, I'm just gonna sit here. <laughs> Thanks, wire. Um, so this stuff's pretty good. Um, USB charger for lithium polymer batteries. Adafruit makes these, they're like five bucks, but I lose them constantly because like, look, look at the size of this thing. Um, what else? Safety pins, big, small, whatever you want to do, um, are always good. Sewing needles. Yeah, that's pretty much my, my kit that doesn't, that is wearable specific. Um, the, the wire tools obviously go in my regular robotics kit as well. Um, I usually carry around a couple LEDs for debugging. I actually had a couple of these NeoPixels die while I was sewing, and the way I would test it is by connecting just like a little LED, the negative to the negative of the NeoPixel, and the positive to whatever I wanted to test on the NeoPixel, and to see if a pin was dead. So if the out pin was dead, or well, rather alive, if I touched the negative to the negative of the NeoPixel, and the positive to the out, it would flicker, because it was receiving data, signal, and form of power. But if it, wouldn't fl it wasn't flickering, then the out pin was broken. And that actually happened on two of my pixels. And that's how I found out was I took an LED. And it's like basically a cheap voltmeter. It's like saying, OK, is there power here? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, do, I get these questions, um, even the second question. In fact, a lot the second question. Um, do I even know how to sew? I don't. So, I guess not. Um, <laughs> that's my common response is uh, I, 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 I technically can sew with a machine and I can sew like straight lines. Don't ask me to fix the sewing machine or if it's broken, I kind of throw my hands up and I'm like, well, that, that's broken, yep. And uh, yeah, so basically to get the neopixels all I have to do is like just back and forth, back and forth. Like you don't, you don't need a lot of sewing. Even if you're doing like trails of conductive thread, it's just in and out, in and out. Not, not terribly difficult. Will I shock myself? Will I set myself on fire? Or will I explode? No, no, and probably not. And <laughs> the only way you will shock yourself is if you are using more than three seven volts or you take a bath in your wearables with the battery <laughs> in. Um, the way, th I am very remedial to the way electricity works, but this is what I do know. Volts don't kill you, amps kill you, but volts are what get the electricity in your system. So you need a high voltage and a not very high amperage to kill you. 3.7 volts is not a lot. Um, like I said, unless you are like, drenched in water, you are probably not going to shock yourself on 3.7 volts of battery. That being said, if you're working with relays, EL wire, anything that goes above 7, 8 volts, you do need to be careful because you can shock yourself with that. Uh, be very careful working with relays or EL wire because those are both voltages enough to shock you. Kill you? Probably not. Shock uh, appliances? Probably will. Uh, EL wire probably won't kill you, but it will hurt really bad. Um, not from personal experience, of course. Uh, <laughs> will you set on fire? No. No. You will not set on fire. Um, hmm? You might burn yourself. And the most common way to burn yourself is obviously a soldering iron. Um, for a way for electronics to burn you, a short will cause a lot of heat. Most of the microcontrollers I've talked about will shut off if they detect a short. So they will not harm you. However, they can get quite hot before they stop, before they turn off. So you can burn yourself. Uh, I have burned myself on a short once. It was a minor burn about the size of like half of my fingertip. It was not that bad. Will you explode? The only way you will explode any of these battery packs is if you remove the connector, short them, and leave them there for about an hour. Um, 
You have to be, you have to have serious malicious intent to explode one of these batteries. Um, if you're if you're that terrified of it, like I was until about three months ago, you can use um, standard batteries with an adapter. So like uh, coin cells or or AAA's. You know, always consult um, an engineer or a recipe if you're like working from someone else's work on how much power you should use. How do I get power? Um, I have been converted to a lithium polymer fan. Um, they're super safe. They're kind of they're not terribly cheap, but they're rechargeable, so I mean, you can kind of do the math there. Um, and I happen to really like them, uh, but I mean, you can always, like I said, use like coin cells or triple A's or double A's. Um, you just need to, again, make sure you don't put too much voltage into your microcontroller or uh, yourself. So another question I get is how can you, how can I get involved? And um, build it, document it, share it. Like uh, Siri, I, I say this a lot when I do when I talk about robotics. Uh, document it, especially if something went wrong, because chances are that's going to go wrong for someone else. So def definitely document the bad parts as well as the good parts. But we definitely want to see your work, especially with NodeBots. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of this yet, I, I guess, because we don't have a lot of members. But forums.nodebots.io is great. It's a message board that uh, Chris started. And um, we, I, yeah, we've got some great conversations going on already. But I'd definitely like to see more on there. And so if you build something, even if it seems trivial to you, post it. We want to hear about it. So that's how you can get involved. And this is way easier than it looks. So that's the other thing I want to say. Like, if I can do this, anybody can do this. Um, I, I can barely sew. I don't know a ton a lot about electronics. I, I, I know some JavaScript. And um, I was able to build these. So I mean, this is something you can do. So the rest of the time, which, wow, I'm actually doing pretty good on time. Uh, Q&A, if anybody has questions, um, yeah, that'd be great. Now would be the time, yes. Have you played with the lily pad? Have I played with the lily pad? Yes. Uh, I played with the lily pad. I have a Gemma in my toolkit back at the speaker room. Um, they're great for as we know. Um, I, I mean, I'm kind of waiting for someone to figure out non-tethered Arduino JavaScript, but you know, I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed on that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, it's nice though for wearables. It's just JavaScript wearables, not so much. Yes. So where do you think wearables are going in the future? Um, that's a good question, uh, as I wear my smartwatch and my light-up skirt. Um, <laughs> I definitely see them be, ha, being an industry in themselves, like part, as obviously part of tech, but um, I definitely see them exploding, and there are a lot of really good uses for wearable technology. Not all are nasty surveillance NSA-type applications. Um, the Ringly I've seen recently is really cool. It's a, it's a woman's fashion ring that vibrates when you get uh, phone calls or, or uh, notifications, and it has like a little light that changes color. And it looks really nice. Like It doesn't look like this, where it's like this. You know, it's something you can wear with a nice outfit, not like you know a Pebble or an LG watch where you can only wear it with uh, certain clothing. Um, but yeah, I definitely see it becoming a field. I also see it becoming more and more of a hobbyist like playground, um, as people like me are more and more inclined and few, have fewer and fewer barriers into making wearables, I see a lot more uh, cosplay enthusiasts wearing electronics. Um, I'm making a hockey stick for my friend that lights up when he hits the ground so he can like go all Gandalf and be like, you shall not pass. Like, it's going to look really cool. But, um, <laughs> like, and what's cool is I'm teaching him how to code building it. So I'm using an Esperino and I'm teaching him JavaScript. And, and he's been coding for all two days. And he's like, I can do this. I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> so, yeah, um, definitely. Definitely see it being a thing. Um, I'm kind of curious about why wearables other than as a hobby. But you kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I can elaborate a little more on that. Um, there's a lot of safety features that wearables can kind of interact with that uh, regular technology can't. Uh, one interesting thing is like uh, tracker from Bravo. Um, they have the little coin-sized Bluetooth beacon. And uh, the, the way that they collect data is pretty ingenious. Anytime you walk across or near any tracker beacon, even if it's not yours, it logs the GPS position of that beacon. That way, if you lose something, you can get the GPS coordinates of that item. Uh, it's good for pets, good for laptops, bikes. It's, it's actually um, apparently restored a lot of bikes to their owners in San Francisco because they just, just you know put one since they're small they're hard to spot. Um, in a front wheel? Probably. I 
said. The new one can if the old one can. The new one's like the size of a quarter. It's, it's remarkably tiny. I just said my front tire's still up, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it, other than a hobby, there are a lot of things that we can do with wearables that, you know, and, and also from an education standpoint, um, kids love showing off their work. And if you get them to build a robot that kind of like sits on a desk and that's, that's cool and they'll think that's awesome, but if you give them a robot like they can wear, like I'm really impressed with Sarah Chip's Julie Bots that she's made where it's these 3D printed bracelets with neopixels in them that shows girls how to program their jewelry. And from an education standpoint, that's amazing because these, these, these and, and not just girls, these people can like, these children can program their jewelry and run around and be like, look, I did this. And so from an education standpoint, I definitely see it as a, as a really good way to get children involved in STEM. Yes. So for someone who doesn't, hasn't ever done any of this, First, first steps. You mentioned Adafruit. Would that probably be like the best place to start learning? Yes. Absolutely basic nothing. Yes. Um, they have a fantastic wearable section uh, curated by Becky Stern, who works for them. Uh, you'll recognize her immediately. She has hot pink hair and she looks awesome. And she's always covered in some sort of wearable technology. <laughs> they have wearable articles going back to like 2009 uh, of projects, and she comes up with a new project like every three weeks or so. Um, so I definitely start there. Um, I would start possibly building with Arduino, but maybe with JavaScript. Like I would kind of, if I can read the Arduino, I try to convert it into JavaScript as quickly as I can. That's up to you how you want to do it. But as for wiring and power and ideas, yes, Adafruit is a really good place to start. And they actually carry the Esperino now, which is pretty, and they carry SparkCores too. Yeah, they carry both of those. So that's pretty cool. Yes? Uh, have you considered commercial applications? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like the the stuff I wear, not really like my skirt. I don't see that being like commercial, uh, mostly because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to turn it into a business. But um, other people doing it, yeah, I can see that happening. I, I can definitely see that happening. There's always a lot of interest in um, in what I wear and how I've made it, and um, I like making gifts for friends, and I like making what I like to make. I do see someone else like catching on to this idea and making it a business. It's just probably only me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Ravers are interested in it, and I, I, I see it to me as more of a, I, I need to teach people how to do this more than I need to sell it to them, because um, we need more coders. <laughs> so, any other questions? All right. Well, I'll be at the party. Um, if you have any questions, if you think of any questions, you can totally come up to me at the party. Um, and we can talk about all sorts of stuff, like robotics and wearables. Uh, I'm Cassandra Perch. I'm Node Botanist on Twitter. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening.